So the next uh, welcome. So next speaker of the morning session is uh, Professor Balaraman Ravindran no, from so IIT Madras, and he'll be talking about influence maximization in unknown social networks, learning policies for effective graph sampling. Anyway, uh, uh, so morning, folks. I'm going to talk about. Well, there are too many wires on the floor. A little scary to walk around looking at my slides. Uh, so I'm going to talk about influence maximization unknown social networks. Um, but primarily, uh, I'm going to talk about reinforcement learning. I mean, so that's what I know best. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll end up uh, talking about that. And uh, so before I get on, I'll, a small note about uh, uh, the Robert Bosch Center for Data Science in AI. Uh, it's a strongly interdisciplinary center that we set up in IIT Madras uh, to look at uh, data science in AI. And it has uh, uh, participation from at least 10 different departments now. And we are growing, hoping to include more. And uh, so uh, earlier, when people are talking about inter strongly interdisciplinary, they said engineering is one of the disciplines. But IIT Madras, I can't afford to do that. So we have computer science and engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical, <laughs> chemical, civil, all of these people part of the center. Apart from that, we also have the uh, uh, biotechnology department, the biosciences and bioengineering people, and uh, management school, mathematics, and uh, the humanities also part of the center. So we even explore questions like ethics and policy related to AI and so on and so forth and projects from the center. Right? And uh, so a quick advertisement. So we, we offer a couple of fellowships. One, this is new, it's called the Post Baccalaureate Fellowship, uh, which is for people who recently finished their undergrad or their first degree. If you're doing a dual degree, uh, if you recently finished their first degree to come and spend up to two years with us. And uh, we have a reasonable stipend, uh, but more importantly, you get to interact with a lot of uh, faculty, visitors, uh, all the exciting events that happen. We almost have at least one workshop slash conference slash school happening every month at the center. And so there's the opportunity to participate in all of that and uh, so on and so forth. And we also have a post-doc program uh, where uh, apart from the usual uh, um, uh, privileges of a postdoc, okay, uh, I, I mean, I, excuse me, I mean, somebody laughs and I said privileges of a postdoc, I'm, I'm not to, <laughs> but then uh, you, we, we do give a significantly higher stipend than the government uh, postdoc stipend, uh, but more importantly, you're allowed to write proposals to the center and, and actually direct your own grant, right? So which is something that uh, with, uh, gives you an opportunity to, you know, uh, grow as, uh, in your academic career. All right, so switching gears. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, reinforcement learning first, right, before I jump into uh, the main talk. So uh, many, many people are familiar with uh, uh, machine learning. Uh, yeah, sometimes people do use this and not the elephant and the penguin uh, to describe machine learning. Uh, so you have uh, you know, a lot of data and then you have labels associated with this data and your goal is to learn a function uh, that maps these uh, inputs to, to labels. Right? So primary goal is uh, learning from data. Uh, so this is normally how I introduce reinforcement learning. So think about this. Uh, think about how you learn to cycle. Right? So did you learn cycling from data? Right? I can give you 10,000 hours of videos of people cycling from Facebook, uh, from YouTube. Right? So well, God knows. Um, so but my phone has become like my operating system now, right? So I, I, I really have no clue what app I'm clicking on because it just keeps popping notifications. I click. So all apps have merged into one thing for me now. <laughs> and, and anyway, uh, so you learn to cycle by getting on the cycle, right? So you have to do some kind of a trial and error learning. You can't learn cycling uh, just by uh, data alone. And uh, it's not that you don't get any feedback. Uh, cycling is not completely uh, unsupervised. You get feedback. Right? The feedback is in terms of uh, things like you know falling down, get you know, falling down, you get hurt, right? A, so you don't want to fall down, so you try to stay balanced. Or if you are a kid learning to cycle, and uh, if you do something clever, then there's a parent or somebody sitting there clapping, hey, good boy, well done, and things like that. So that's the kind of feedback you are getting, right? But nobody really tells you how to actually ride the cycle, right? So that's something you figure out by doing some exploration. Right? So I I distinguish the kind of learning that you do with uh, cycling as learning from evaluation, right? as opposed to learning from instruction, which is what was happening in this earlier case. Right? So here, somebody tells you beforehand, hey, if this picture comes, then you have to say it's a dog. You're being instructed as to what is the right response. Right? 
Uh, but when you come to cycling, you don't get any instructions. You try things out, right? and then you get evaluated. Right? It's like learning a subject only by writing exams. Right? So it's something like that. Right? And it's, it's not cycling. I picked up cycling because it's a very uh, recent thing that uh, even adults can remember. Uh, but uh, if you think of how people learn to walk or talk and so on and so forth, all of these are this kind of trial and error mechanisms. Right? And uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you how you can learn through trial and error by looking at a very simple uh, um, Uh, looking at a very simple uh, example, right? So people are familiar with tic-tac-toe, right? Yeah. So no, 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 no complex systems here. Just tic-tac-toe. We'll, we'll, we'll demonstrate how to learn tic-tac-toe. Uh, so if I'm teaching a machine to play tic-tac-toe through supervised learning or the classical machine learning methods, it'll work something like this. So I'll give you a set of positions, right? And I'll give you a set of moves that you're supposed to make. So these are the expert moves. So basically, I'm telling the agent, OK, if this is the position, then this is the move that you have to make. Now learn a map so that you can, given any position, you'll know what is the right move to make. Right, right move as defined by the expert. Okay, so that's basically what uh, uh, supervised learning would do if you're trying to teach tic-tac-toe. On the other hand, the reinforcement learning way of learning tic-tac-toe would be something like this. Hey, go play the game. Do whatever you want. If you win, I'll give you a plus one. If you lose, I'll give you a minus one. If you draw the game, I'll give you a zero. Right? Somehow learn to play the game. The only thing is, I give you repeated plays, so you can play how many ever times you want. At the end of it, you should know how to play a decent game of tic-tac-toe. So that's the real crux between how supervised learning operates, how reinforcement learning operates. Right? Supervised learning tells you a priori, before you start learning anything, what are the moves to make. In reinforcement learning, you play it, then I evaluate your play, and then based on that, you improve your play. Okay, so this is the difference in setting. And so I'll give you a very simple uh, way of looking at it. So let's say this is the tic-tac-toe game. So you start off from some position, you have nine possible moves that you could make, and then your opponent could make some response, and then you could make another response to it, and so on and so forth, until the end uh, when you could potentially win. So there are three X's in a row here, and that means you have one, right? Uh, so let's take a typical game. So let's take a path through this tree. Right? So that's how a game progresses. So when I come to the end, and I find that I have one, so what do I do is I go back, and for every move that x made along the way, I increase the probability of making that move again. Make sense? So for every move that x made in a winning game, I'll increase the probability of making the move. And for if I lose the game, I'll go back and see for every move that x made in that game, I'll decrease the probability. And if I draw the game, I'll just leave the probabilities unchanged. Okay. And I keep doing this again and again and again. And you can actually show that eventually the probabilities will converge so that you're taking only actions that lead to winning moves. Uh, and then you are not taking actions that are uh, going to take you to really losing moves. Right? And, the, and the probability with which you pick this will be proportional to the probability of winning. From that. So where do the probabilities of winning come in here? Because your opponent is, could potentially be playing randomly. Right? So it's not that every time you play, even if you make the same move, your opponent did not respond in a similar fashion. Okay? So obviously, tic-tac-toe is an over, overly simple domain. Right? But you can see aspects of this come up everywhere else. Okay. So, so it's clear right? So what we are trying to do. And this is one way, this is a very valid way of actually learning to play tic-tac-toe through Evaluation. So this is this is a valid reinforcement learning algorithm. Okay, but then I waited all the way till the end to find out whether I win or lose. Right? Let us say that I encountered that position halfway through the game. Right? Do I need to keep playing the game to know whether I won or lost? At this point, there is nothing that O can do that will stop X from winning. Right? So I won. Right? So Instead of waiting all the way to the end and then finding out that I won, when I encounter a position like this, I can basically go back and say, hey, increase the chances of putting an X here. Make sense? Right? And don't wait till the end and then say, aha, okay, I won the game, so let us increase the probability of this action, this action, 
that action and so on and so forth. Instead of doing that, I can say, oh, I looks like I'm winning, so let me increase the probability of putting an X here. I don't have to wait till the end. Right? So that cuts down my horizon for learning. I can start learning as soon as I recognize a winning position. Right? Okay, so how did I recognize that this was a winning position? A lot of you nodded when I said, I don't have to play till the end, I have won from here. So how did you recognize that it was a winning position? Anyone? Any, any huh? How did you know that? You actually played it in your head, right? And you knew the rules of the game, so you know that, hey, you can analyze the position and say, hey, yeah, there's nothing that zero can do from here that I can win. So I needed to know the rules of the game. I needed to do this analysis to recognize that as a winning position. Tic-tac-toe is fine. But suppose I'm doing something more complex, right? Is it always possible to do that kind of an analysis? Maybe, maybe not, but even in cases where I'm not able to do that kind of analysis, I can take advantage of the fact that I am playing this repeatedly, and I can keep track, hey, how many times did I win after I got to this position in the past? And I can just keep track of what, what is the expected probability of winning from here, just based on my past experience. Right? Now, when I make a move, I go from a position that had a 60% chance of winning to a position that has a 90% chance of winning, then that's a good move. Right? I don't have to know how I win from there, just that I know that it has a 90% chance of winning, so it's a good move, so I'll increase the probability. If you go from a position that has a 60% chance of winning to something that has a 30% chance of winning, then I'll decrease the probability of taking that action. Right? So I don't have to wait till the end. I can just look one step ahead by keeping track of these probabilities and then make my decisions of increasing or decreasing the action probabilities just based on that. Is that clear? Right, so I don't have to wait. So in fact, I can actually learn even when I don't know when the game will end, as long as I have this, this kind of an estimate of the probabilities of winning. Right, so it makes it easier for me to control dynamical systems. Tic-tac-toe is easy. Right? When you start talking about controlling complex dynamical systems, I really can't do all of the simulations to the end and so on and so forth. And this allows me to learn even for complex dynamic system control. Okay? So this basic idea is called something called temporal difference learning. And this was proposed back in uh, 83 uh, by Bar Bartow, Sutton, and Anderson. Uh, and it's a really simple rule if you think about it. And uh, so the prediction of outcome at time t plus 1 is better than the prediction at time t. Uh, because I'm potentially closer to getting a payoff, right? And therefore, I use the prediction at time t plus 1 to adjust what I do at time t. Okay? So that's, that's basically the idea. And not just in AI, but it has had profound impact in behavioral psychology and in neuroscience as well. Uh, people use the TD rule a lot uh, in uh, different domains. So is it, is it uh, basic idea is clear, right? I'm not going to get into any more, uh, uh, more details of this. Any questions on this? One based on t. No, 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 no. At, I'm going to predict the final outcome. At every point of time, I'm predicting the final outcome. What is the likelihood that I will win? Right? I make that prediction at t. I make the same prediction at t plus 1. Right. I'm looking at the difference in the predictions at t plus 1 and t. But what I'm predicting is still the likelihood, likely outcome. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah I can say the, the argument why this statement is true. <coughs> But you know, if you also know uh, something about the opponent's move, then you don't have to wait till t, uh, time t plus one. You can, from the very beginning of the process, you can list what are the various possibilities. Sure, 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 and, sure, sure, you know, sure. Using uh, analogy to what you talked about, backward yeah. induction, yeah. I can also tell you what kind of moves you will be taking. Sure. So, so I don't really have to wait. Uh, no, no, so I, I agree. So, uh, so I picked tic-tac-toe because it's an easy example. But whenever you have an other agent in the world who is giving you the stochasticity, then you, can, you have other techniques for, plan, for learning and planning, right? So you have like, things like min-max search, which essentially takes into account what your opponent's best response could be, and so on and so forth. And there are min-max versions of reinforcement learning. But uh, the tic-tac-toe example was something taken to simplify the exposition. You could think of doing this in cycling. Cycling, there is no agent, right? It's just stochasticity in the world, 
right? So when you, whenever I'm cycling, that could be a small pebble that was not modeled, and so my cycle could just wobble. You know, I might be, I might have been doing the right things all along. So there might be some noise in how the system re uh, responds to me, and that is basically your opponent in the tic-tac-toe case. But in real, that's why I said in complex systems, the things become more more interesting. Right here, you have other methods for solving this. RL is not necessarily the best way of doing this. Uh, but having said that, a lot of recent success in uh, two-player games uh, have come from reinforcement learning. Uh, but that those reinforcement learning methods actually have an aspect of min-max search in them. They are not they are not pure RL. They do a small amount of min-max search in them as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Anything else? Okay, great. Uh, so reinforcement learning works. A lot of success stories. Uh, so people might have heard of all this game playing success story. That's Go, and that's chess, and that's uh, Dota, and then all kinds of things like flying helicopters, playing robo soccer, right, and playing backgammon, and then recommender systems, and then that's a power system control application, right. So Google managed to reduce their uh, data center cooling bills by 40 percent by using a reinforcement learning based uh, controller for power. And that was an example from a protein folding competition that, uh, again, uh, DeepMind did, uh, did a fantastic job last year, uh, beating the next best human entry by like 25% or something. And uh, yeah, so, I'm, so, so RL has been very successful. So what, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is another application of reinforcement learning, which is something that is not traditionally uh, associated with. And in fact, all the papers that we know on applying reinforcement learning on network discovery appeared in 2019. Uh, so no, nothing before that. And since I, I also do a lot of work in networks and RL, so for me it was very nice being able to merge the two. And uh, before I get in there, uh, just a short uh, note on uh, what do we need uh, to design something as a reinforcement learning solution. Okay? So there are three things that we need to decide on. So first is the set of states your system can be in. Right? So this probably this audience really doesn't need me to explain what states are. Uh, but I would say it's a description about your system so that you have enough information to take decisions. Right? It's not just the raw sensory input. It could be some kind of processed inputs. It could be history. Right? It could be some kind of domain information that you're using. Whatever it is, enough information to make decisions on. Okay? So that I will call as a state. And actions are essentially your control variables. It could be moves in a game, or it could be items to recommend, or talks to a motor, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And then the reward uh, typically defines the goal of the problem. So in tic-tac-toe, it was winning. Uh, and uh, in cycling, it was, could be the negative of falling, because you want to avoid falling. Right? So, so whatever is the goal of the uh, system, uh, you think about it, and then come up with the reward function. Right? So you have to be very careful in defining the rewards, uh, because the agent really dumbly optimizes for the reward that you define, right? And, and so I have this um, example that I give my students, right? Uh, so there was a student, uh, this uh, visitor to our lab a long time back when I was doing my PhD. Uh, she wanted to design a, a reinforcement learning agent that learns to ride a cycle. Because everybody keeps giving this example of cycling uh, as a prototypical RL problem. She said, okay, fine. So I'll build a, a physics, I mean, like a real simulator for a cycle, and then put a uh, RL agent on it and ask it to learn. And then I'll give it a reward. Okay? The reward she say, gave was, there is this open space. The, the agent could cycle anywhere. So it has to learn to get on the cycle, stay balanced, and then choose a direction to ride the cycle in, and come to a specified point in this space. And when it reaches that point, it gets a reward. Otherwise, it gets no reward. Right? So finally, it says, ah, OK, you get a plus one. It's like, like you get a reward for playing the game. You get a reward for coming to that point. And she set it up. And then after a long time, she found that the agent was not learning anything. Because it was just too long, too long a sequence of actions. Staying balanced was very hard. Right? Learning to pedal was very hard. And then you have to do that for a long time before you even get a little bit of a feedback. Right? So it had no clue what it was trying to learn. Okay? So she said, OK, I'm going to help the agent. And she introduced a small uh, positive reward, right? positive payoff, whenever the component of the velocity, whenever there was a non-zero component of the velocity of the cycle towards the goal. So she thought, hey, this will push the agent to go towards the goal. Right? And then she ran. And after a while, she found that the program did not finish running at all. So 
Guess what happened? Hmm? Yeah, so the, the agent started riding, learned to ride a cycle very well, but it was going in a circle. Because halfway in the circle, there was a component of velocity towards the goal. And, and then it'll go back, and then it'll start coming towards the goal, and then it'll go back and start coming towards the goal. It'll never reach the goal, because reaching the goal gives it a reward and it stops. Right? This way, it just keeps getting infinite amounts of reward. So it learns something very unexpected. Right? So if you try to be very clever in your uh, payoff function, uh, so the agent might optimize it in ways that you didn't expect it to. So you have to, this is, this is part of the design process, right? So all of these are not obvious. So you have to think really hard about, okay, how am I communicating to the agent uh, the right things that I want the agent to solve, uh, that the agent needs to solve the problem, okay? Fine, so I'll move on. This is actual paper that we'll talk about today. <laughs> Uh, influence maximization in unknown social networks, uh, learning policies for effective graph sampling. Uh, this is uh, joint work with uh, Harsha, who is a, a master's student with me, just finishing up. Priyesh, who finished last year, who is now at McGill, uh, master's student. Again, Brian, who is a final year PhD student at Harvard with Milan uh, Tambe, who most people still think he is at USC, but he moved to Harvard in August last year. I should probably start putting Harvard slash Google now. He's 50% at Google and 50% at Harvard. I think this is going to appear in AMAS uh, uh, 2020, which is uh, a couple of months later. And it's on archive if people want to look at it. Okay, so then we're going to talk about the influence maximization problem. Uh, so the goal here is to pick influential nodes from a social network as peer leaders to help disseminate information to the maximum nodes in the network. Right? So what do I mean by that? Let's, let's imagine there's this network and I can hastily drawn using PowerPoint graphics. Uh, and uh, so these blue guys are the people or who are the peer leaders, right? And I choose some kind of a dynamics here. Uh, a node is influenced here. If at least two of its neighbors are already blue, then the node will change its color to blue, right? It's uh, among all its friends. If two of the friends are already influenced, it's a very simple dynamic. You can think of many, many different such models for influence propagation. So what, how, what will happen now? Then you'll have some nodes get influenced because of this initial set and then some more, and then some more, and eventually you'll have a large fraction of the graph getting influenced uh, by the initial seed that you put in there, right? So here, I mean, the whole graph gets influenced, but typically that doesn't happen. Typically some fraction of the graph gets influenced, right? So now the goal is, uh, given a graph, right, select some K nodes to activate, uh, such that the, at the end of this diffusion process, you have the maximum number of nodes that are activated, right? Uh, so, uh, one of the motivating applications for us to look at uh, was something that uh, the, uh, the USC people were doing with the homeless youth in uh, California, so in LA. So they, they, they found out that there was this sudden spurt in uh, incidence of HIV among homeless uh, kids. And the main reason was that they were having really unsafe use of needles. So they needed to get this information out to people. So they said, okay, let's find out the leaders in the homeless community. And then, and then we'll talk to them, make them understand this, and then let them go out and spread the news. And the effectiveness is measured by next, next week when they do a camp for HIV testing, they look at how many people actually come in and get tested. Right? So, and uh, so that's basically one of the examples that, uh, uh, that motivated us. And, uh, but then the similar ideas have, have been looked at uh, studying uh, how, uh, how uh, rural women adopt microfinance models in, in Karnataka. Right? And that was done by Microsoft, and they used a similar kind of uh, influence propagation uh, model and so on and so forth. And uh, so what we are going to use is a, a simple uh, um, independent cascade model for most of our simulations. Right? So that, that's easy to simulate, and we don't have to worry about too many things. So, but then uh, the overall uh, architecture that I'm presenting doesn't really depend on what the underlying uh, simulation model is. You can plug in any model, and it will still work. Of course, you have to retrain the whole thing. If you change the model, but it'll still work, right? But what was the challenge? So the homeless youth are not on Facebook or WhatsApp or LinkedIn or anything, right? So it's impossible for me to conveniently gather their social network, right? So I have to do this the old-fashioned way. I have to go out and start talking to people, right? Go around with a survey thing and say, okay, can you name three of your friends and et cetera, et cetera, and then, and then go around and try and construct a network like that. Now, this is time consuming, right? And uh, also, 
potentially uh, dangerous. <laughs> but uh, more than that, uh, effort required is really high. Right? So I really have to go out and interview these people. And uh, so typically, we have a budget of queries. We can't just indefinitely go around asking people, OK, who are your friends, and so on and so forth. We need to either, like, OK, let me do this over a one hour period, or let me go out and ask 10 people, right? not more. And then I have to somehow construct my network by just asking these 10 people. Okay? So the, uh, the way they're constructing the, the structuring the solution is that they have some kind of an initial graph. They know like two or three people who are in this network. right? And then uh, they have a network discovery phase where they start querying nodes okay, and then asking about their neighbors. And then they do this in a stage-wise manner. And then they recover enough of the graph. Right? So once they have a graph, right, note that this graph need not be the complete graph. They just have a graph now, right? some, sub, some subgraph of this actual uh, uh, social graph that you want to model. Then they run their influence maximization algorithm on this subgraph that is discovered. Okay? Then they pick the K peer leaders that we want and somehow influence those K guys. And then let them go, go out and spread the influence on the graph. Right? But when these guys go out and act on the graph, they are not limited to the graph that you know. They are actually acting on the real social network. Right? Therefore, that information will spread. And hopefully, then people will come back and you know get tested and so on and so forth. Then you know what how far your influence spread, right? So yeah. Is there a minimum in the K, the number of people? We have a budget, so we have to figure out how many people we can talk to because this requires volunteers. Right. Yeah. Uh, idea. Huh? So is there a theory which says that you need to have minimum number of K effective point? So I'm not 100 percent sure if there is a theory that says that for a given graph K is the least that you need. I don't know if that's a universal lower bound. But given a K, I can tell you what would be the extent, or at least can give an approximation of the extent uh, of the influence. So it, it's a hard problem. So people have uh, good approximation algorithms for it. So given a K, how far it will spread. So that way I can start, uh, so I can have a greedy algorithm. I can just compute, so OK, for one node, what is the best one node? What is the best two nodes? What are the best three nodes? I can keep growing until I get to K. And that gives me a decent approximation of the best K. So that's 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 all I can say. I don't know if there are lower bound results. So, so what's the reward? And, uh, coming, coming, coming. That's the rest of the talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, I don't know, so I don't know. I didn't want to put Sitabra on the spot, but uh, so the question was: Given a graph, is there a lower bound that says that you need at least this many nodes for you to hit 30% of the graph or something like that? I, I, yeah, I, at least if it is there, it is not well known. Okay. So now I'm generalizing from two sample points, but. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so that's the basic idea. So I, I need an algorithm for sampling this. So I need an algorithm for doing the influence maximization. And that's not the focus of the talk. So I'll use any off the shelf algorithm for actually picking the K nodes. The goal here is to figure out what is the best way to discover the graph. Okay, so here is the setup. Uh, so I have a state. Right, the state is my current graph. Okay? So here, all the nodes and edges, this constitute my full graph. Okay? So this is my full graph. Right? And everything that is colored are the nodes that I know about right now, nodes and edges that I know about right now. Right? And so the gray ones are things that I have already queried, so that I don't, I don't need to ask them again about their neighbors. Right? And the red ones and the orange one also or things I could potentially ask. Right? So my state is the state of the network, the state of the graph now. Right? So how much, how much of the graph I have discovered? Right? The, all the collection of the nodes and edges of the discovered subgraph. And the actions are essentially the ones that are colored not gray. Okay? So, so the reds and the orange are the potential actions I could take. Okay? So the reward is a tricky part. We'll come to the reward in a bit. So now, what has happened here, just to describe the flow, the agent has taken in this colored graph and then has decided to query the node marked V here. Okay? So when I query the node marked V, that's the action I have taken. When I query the node marked V, it's going to tell me, hey, all these people are my neighbors. It will give me a list of four. But this one I already know, so that stays that way. So these three brown nodes are the ones that I add to my graph. So my new state is this, the, the new colored graph there on the right. 
So when I take an action, I move to a new state. Right? Now if my query budget is exceeded, then I stop. So now I have this, all these colored nodes here. This is my final graph. I run an influence maximization algorithm on it. It picks these three green nodes as the most likely to be influenced, um, uh, most likely leaders. And then I start my process from there, and then I get a score. Right? Notice that when I start my process from the green nodes, some of these white nodes also could get influenced. It's not like the influence is limited only to the gray nodes. People outside those also might be influenced, and they get added to my score eventually. Okay? If my query is not exceeded, now this becomes my new state. Right? And then I go back and continue with my selection process. Is that clear? So the state is the current st state of the, the set of nodes and edges I have discovered in the graph, the current subgraph. I pick one node in the subgraph to query for its neighbors. Okay? Then I get the additional neighbors, add them and the, and, and the edges to the subgraph, and that becomes my new state. Right? If I have exceeded my budget if I have, or exhausted my budget, I go back, run an influence maximization algorithm on the discovered subgraph, run the diffusion process from the k top nodes, figure out what is the maximum score that I'm getting, use that as my reward. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. The network is already existing. I'm trying to discover the network. I'm not designing the network. The network exists. Discover the part of the network. The, discover the part of the network. See, ideally what I'm looking for is to, given, let's say I have a query of five nodes. Okay? Maybe I can only go out and ask five people. Okay? Given that I can query only five nodes, I need to discover a subgraph such that if I run influence maximization on the subgraph and the k nodes that I get should not be very different from the k nodes I get if I run influence maximization on the entire graph. So that is why the reward that I get is the influence score on the entire graph. Without, right? graph. Without doing the influence maximization on the entire graph, but I'm trying to get the score on the entire graph. You may not even know the entire graph. I may yeah. not even know the entire graph. In fact, even at the end of the process, I might not know the entire graph. Yeah. So what would be the typical size of that? Graph? It varies. So some of the graphs, homeless youth and all is in the like hundreds. Uh, not, not even the hundreds, maybe about 70, 80. The homeless are very small, thankfully, uh, uh, but uh, some of the other networks were fairly large. So the, the rural women network run in, runs into hundreds, and uh, we have looked at data, synthetic data that run into thousands of nodes. But if you start going into millions of nodes, uh, I'm not sure how scalable this will be. No, we can make it scalable, but you have to come uh, come back with an appropriate use case for me to put in the effort. So I, I haven't seen the use case in millions of nodes yet. All the all the real life social network use cases we see. At most, run into thousands of nodes. Yeah. Uh, good question. So it depends on my initial. Remember, I was telling you I had an initial graph. So if my initial graph is connected, I might end up growing in a connected way. But the initial graph actually comes from different components of the graph. Initial uh, 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 vertices come from different components of the graph. I could potentially grow in a different way. Having said that. We observed how this ran multiple times. So even if nodes come from different components, during the process of learning, I tend to grow things in a connected way. It turns out that seems to be the best thing to do for the influence maximization. In, in fact, it's better for me to discover the largest component in the graph than about the smaller connected components and a little bit about the larger component. So, so we, we didn't uh, encourage it to do one or the other in any way. Uh, but it turned out to. It, it turns out to like to grow the connected way. Yeah. Yeah. Reward is a lot more complicated. That's what makes so, the thing uh, interesting. Choice yeah. of reward would also influence the final. Uh, yes. The reward essentially defines the problem that you're solving. So there's no uniqueness to that kind of stuff. Meaning? Meaning. So the outcome would finally. Of your network yeah. or whatever, yeah. it would depend on the type of reward that you Yes, yes. That's what I said. The reward function, that's why I was telling you about the cycling in the circle right. problem. Right? So very the, clear there. Yeah. Here it is a little more reward. Yeah, so for example, I, I'll tell you in a bit something that we had to do. 
that reduces the effectiveness of the approach a little bit, but actually makes it run in a more reasonable time. So I'll come to that in a bit. You had a question? No. No. Okay. no. Fine. Okay. Fine. So one of the things that we needed to do to twiddle with the reward function, right? So right now the reward function, basically you have to select all your nodes and then you do the diffusion process and then you get the reward. It turned out that was not conducive to fast learning, right? So basically we needed lots and lots of trajectories because during the learning process there was no signal, right? So what we did was we introduced a small step reward. The step reward was essentially proportional to the growth in the size of the network. So for time t, I have a network of size n, and time t plus 1, I have a network of size n prime. So I'll give a reward proportional to n prime minus n. Just very, 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 very tiny reward. But that small gradient was enough for us to actually start learning something. Okay? And of course, it, it started ignoring it after it learned. Because uh, the, the size of the network was not necessarily the right metric, but we needed to do that so that we could give it some gradient while learning. So these are all, uh, this, this, uh, there's absolutely no science behind it. It's more like ad hoc uh, 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 heuristic reward. Uh, but that's something that we needed to make it work. So the science part is the final reward. That's the one that we are trying to optimize. This one was just to give it some kind of a gradient. What was interesting was it did not end up optimizing for that reward. Final solution, it basically learned to ignore. It was not optimizing for the size of the network. Sometimes it actually discovers a smaller network. Sure. And, uh, and then, uh, hey, that doesn't count the questioning time, right? So I'm actually letting people ask a lot of questions. OK, it doesn't. Fine. Thanks. <laughs> OK. Uh, so the reinforcement learning formulation we already talked about. The state is the current state of the graph. Uh, action, all the nodes uh, that have not been queried. So the reward is uh, the final influencing the thing, right? Uh, but then there are a lot of challenges. Uh, I can do all kinds of training I want, but whenever I actually try to deploy the system, it's a new graph. I have not seen that before, right? And I can't wait for me to know anything about the graph because that's too late. So I have to basically take whatever I have learned and apply it on the graph that I have never seen before. So this is something like a zero shot, what they call nowadays a zero shot learning. So I have no experience on the new data, but somehow I had, it has to work on the new data. Right? So what we did was uh, we had to figure out a way of generalizing across graphs. So we used some of the new uh, deep network uh, uh, works on uh, graphs, like graph neural network ideas. And of course, we couldn't do this across the arbitrary graphs. So we said, OK, so graphs that were generated from the same process, like homeless networks or, uh, or uh, rural economic networks and stuff like that. So we'll use graphs generated from similar process or take synthetic graphs which are generated by estimating parameters from the other uh, graph models that we already have from the real world. Right? So that's, that's basically what we ended up doing. And uh, so typically the other heuristics that are there in the literature make some kind of assumptions about the graph families and the graph architectures that are there. And uh, so this, uh, the, the, the representation that we learn uh, substitutes for those assumptions. So instead of making a priori assumptions, we actually derive the structural assumptions from the data itself. Okay? So we did complicated neural network thingies, right, which nobody knows how they work. Uh, uh, but anyway, so that gives me the state, and this gives me the action. Okay? So there are two pathways, one for finding out what the state should be, right? another pathway for finding out what the action should be. Right? And both are now vectors. And then I feed the two vectors into the uh, neural network here. And then that gives me the final uh, uh, decision variable based on which I choose which, which node to query. Okay? And a lot of empirical work went into deciding what aspects of the architecture you need, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, so we ran it on a bunch of different things. We looked at animal uh, wildlife contact networks. We looked at retweet networks because they were easy. And then we looked at the rural uh, microfinance network and also the homeless youth network. Right? And so I'll skip. And uh, so this is basically how we generated the synthetic data. So I'm skipping that. And uh, so this is finally what we got. So, uh, so there is an increased percentage and the improved percentage. Uh, so uh, the increased percentage essentially tells me, OK, I have a performance of x using the best known heuristic. Now I have a performance of y using your method. How much, is, how much better is y than x? OK, so that's the increase. And the uh, improvement percentage is, OK, I have x from the best known heuristic. And now I have the global home truth, the ground truth. right? So I know the full graph. I run influence maximization on the full graph. What, what can I do? So that is y. Okay. 
Now my method runs, I get a z somewhere in between. So how much of the gap between x and y have I cl closed? So if the gap between x and y was just one percentage point, so I can't really expect like a five percentage improvement over x. Right? The, because one, the, the six percentage is the best possible I could do. So if I get a 5.5, .5, I would call it as a 50% closing the gap. Right? Among, so as close as I can get to. So that's the improved percentage. Right? And you can see that uh, I mean, uh, on various networks, we do better. Certainly, we do better than the uh, base network. In some cases, we get uh, uh, somewhere up to 36% uh, increase. Yeah. So I assume that these increases and improvements will also depend on the budget which is spent in oh, the Oh, yeah, the budget was standard. So, but, but, but case, here, yeah. is, here is a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, sure. So no. think of two scenarios. You have a limited budget. Sure. So in scenario one, you spend the entire budget in one iteration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Scenario two, you break it up. Yep. You run uh, the... You, you run two iterations. Mm -hmm. The second iteration is run on the final graph, you know, where you have improved priors. Which scenario will lead to better outcome? Can sure. You so we actually ran experiments with that, right? Is, uh, is doing the a, doing a round-based uh, thing. Huh? Sorry? Is the question clear? Yeah, I, I got the question. So we did, we did run it on, uh, on, on a budget like that, right? So, uh, but the main problem is, especially when I'm talking about homeless networks and stuff like that, uh, for them, practically implementing two phases was not possible. So they needed a way because implementation wise they needed something that yeah conceptually we have experiments we have we have run experiments we have results in the, in the archive version not in the main paper but in the archive version we have results and it, it varies so uh, the bottom line is even when I do this in a stage wise manner uh, the reinforcement learning method gives a slight improvement over the best heuristic not not improvements of this order but they do give a slight improvement over the best heuristic but the main the reason we didn't report that in the main study is because the actual implementation couldn't couldn't accommodate a, uh, this kind of a stage wise uh, thing. Uh, so we have numbers yeah sure time is up uh, so we have numbers okay we are better right so, uh, so one of the things uh, I just wanted to point out um, well we have one more minute according to my watch so I'll take that one more minute uh, I'll, I'll point out is that um, even though we never uh, tell the agent what is the real degree centrality, right? So it has only access to degree centralities in the discovered subgraph. It turns out the degree centrality of nodes it chooses to query, the degrees in the real graph, is much higher than uh, what other methods manage. So it's something, in some sense, the, the representation that we are discovering for the nodes uh, seem to be capturing features that are, uh, uh, you know, that we don't have an intuition as to how to define yet. Right? So same thing for between the centrality also. It actually <coughs> queries nodes with a high between as you can see this here, right? So that's the, the average between the centrality of the reinforcement learning, the, the nodes that we query. And uh, so change is the best known heuristic and that's the average between the centrality. And this is the average between the centrality of all the nodes in the graph. So somehow we seem to be picking, with just the subgraph information, we seem to be picking nodes with high centrality scores on the full graph. Right, so that's that's an interesting observation we made, and of course we do better. Uh, okay, I'll skip that. So I, I I really think that reinforcement learning can be used to solve real problems now, not just fun and. Games. So I always say put RL to work now. So go beyond fun and games, and I have a cautionary note. I guess I guess uh, Giant is going to talk more about it tomorrow, but uh, so the fundamental problem in machine learning I'm still learning associations from data. Most of my ML algorithms don't have any knowledge of the world. Right? They don't know the physics, they don't know the structure, they don't know the processes of the world, and so on and so forth. So in some sense, the ML system's understanding of the world is about a two-year-old, literally. Monkey see, monkey do is what it's doing. And uh, so you have to handle it with care. Why? Because the, right now, the way the ML is, it's no, not like any other two-year-old, it is like this kid. <laughs> right? If you let it run amok, so it might cause a lot of damage, okay? So, and if you want more RL, I have a tutorial that you can look at later. Thanks. No time for questions. We already exhausted everything earlier. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we'll thank uh, Professor Ovindran again. And uh, if you have further questions, we can defer it for later, probably for the lunch break.